Good morning, KMBC. How are you doing this morning? Praise team is here in the house. I got a couple of announcements for you. In your bulletin, you had a form that's for church committees. I'm going to encourage you to fill that out. There is a place in the back. Just put it on there in the table out in the foyer. Um, Also, there's an elders form out there. We're collecting elder nominations all the way through the end of this month. So if you want to nominate somebody for an elder, we encourage you to do that. This is VBS week. Is this not awesome? I'm excited about some VBS. I hope you are. And so we got a week where we're just going to lay in and just share what God is doing here and all that kind of stuff with our kids and just share who God is in the gospel. We invite you to bring your kids for this. The other thing I had for you guys this morning is this. Happy Father's Day. I want you to check out this video. Hello, so you ready to be taken down. Do you have a favorite superhero? Yep, he's the best. Nuh-uh, my superhero is the best. What can your superhero do? My superhero isn't afraid of anything. whenever they need it. He even helps cats. Help! My cat is stuck in the tree! come true in the day, nothing is impossible for my superhero to defeat. wants to teach me to be a superhero just like him. You are an expert in God's law. What does God say? Love God with all of your heart and your neighbor as yourself. You're right. Do that and you'll have eternal life. Unlike some superheroes, mine knows where his powers come from. Hey, Dad! My favorite superhero isn't Superman or Batman or Wolverine or Iron Man. My favorite superhero is better than all of those combined. <laughs> my favorite superhero is my dad. Mine too. Heads <laughs> up! <laughs> <laughs> Who's ready for a water balloon fight? Somebody help!
dads here today who are superheroes that point to the ultimate superhero, Jesus Christ. So, Dad, you are acknowledged today. We appreciate everything you do in leading your family in the ways of God. Amen. Let's give our dads a round of applause today. Well, if you don't mind, let's bow our heads right where we're at now. We're just going to go to God in prayer and ask him to move in this service in a mighty way. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you that, you, God, you sent your son to die upon the cross. We pray that in this worship service there would be an audience of one, and that would be you, God, that our minds would focus and we would hear what you would have us to say and what you would have us to do, God. We just pray, God, that the Holy Spirit would just show us and move here. God, we pray that, um, God, the worship would point us to the throne room of God. We pray that and ask, God, if anybody here doesn't know you as their personal Savior, God, they would call on you today. God, just thank you for what you're doing here at Kinley Missionary Baptist Church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you please stand and join us in worship? Good morning, Kinley Missionary Baptist Church. You might recognize the words to this song, at least to the chorus, from coming from 1 John 4, 4, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world.
are so smiling. Some of you might be here because you're here with your dad or baby. You're here celebrating that special son in your life. But I'm here to tell you that we cannot place our hope on any dad, no matter how awesome or amazing he is. Our hope is found in nothing less than Jesus. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' love and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust.
God, we just ask that you forgive us when we put our hope in other people and other things because we know that there is no other way to heaven by which we must be saved. And you promise in your word that if we will call upon your name, that you will save us. Thank you for your faithfulness, for your mercy, for your love, for your grace, for your forgiveness, for waking up us up this morning and giving us bread. Thank you, Jesus. My worth is not in what I own. Kids come up. Um, I wanted to tell you what God is just doing here. I think part of this is just encouraging you guys and letting y'all see what God is doing underneath. In the past five, three weeks, guys, we have had five people make professions of faith here at Kenley Missionary Baptist Church. Amen? I mean, that's five people. Praise God. <laughs> July 14th, I think we're at six or seven that we're going to be baptizing. But I want to just read you this note I got this past week to show you what God is doing. Sometimes we miss what God is doing because of everything else kind of going on. Listen to this. God is good. I've been saved since December 30th, 1999, but have strayed over the years. The generosity and love that you guys have shown my family has shown me how if, how if you let God work in your life, he will bless you beyond measure. You guys open my eyes to that. I'm not the same dude you met a few months ago. My family isn't the same. We're all growing closer to God every day, and I'm just in awe at how much better life is for that. I want to share the same love and generosity with others that may need it because I felt and seen firsthand how it can change a family's life. We love you guys and can't wait to see what God has planned for my family and KMBC. I want to be part of the greatness that is going on there. That's what's taking place here at Kenyon to see God is just touching lives and they're being transformed. And so I hope God, I hope that just touched your soul the way it touched mine. The offering bearers are going to come on down and um, we'll pray over this. And listen, when you give this morning, you're giving to help families like this to reach out to them. You're not just putting money in an offering plate. So um, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray, God, that, God, we could reach more families and be generous to them and show them the love of God. 
God, I pray, God, that we would be the UPS, the FedEx guys you have called us to be this morning, God, and put in the offering plate what you call us to put in. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Out of many of those who have come to Christ in the past couple of weeks, they were on the stage right there, guys. Many of them, God is moving in our children's department. I think out of the five we've had come to Christ, four of those were in the children's department. One of those was in the youth department, which is why at the end of this service, we're going to be voting on hiring a part-time children's director because, I mean, not hiring a children's director. We're going to be hiring, voting on hiring a search committee to, um, to, to lead us in this children's director search because God is just moving in that department. And so, um, guys, if you can't see it, I mean, you're blind to it this morning. God is just moving in those little children's eyes. I want to encourage you in that. Um, how many of you guys remember back in the day Steve Irwin? Um, he was the guy from Australia down under. He was the guy that would jump on the crocodiles. He was killed because of a stingray. Uh, Y'all remember him? Well, I think that he learned all he learned from Solomon. Um, Solomon was a guy that studied nature. Solomon was a guy that loved horticulture. And and we're going to learn some amazing things about ants today from Solomon. I mean, as I studied this text this past week, I could just picture in my mind Steve Irwin through Solomon saying, isn't that a beaut? I mean, I just, what I could picture in my mind as I was reading this text. As I was studying about ants, I learned some amazing things, that, such as an ant can lift 10 to 50 times its weight. Maybe you didn't know that, but an ant can lift 10 to 50 times its weight. It is said that a queen ant can have over a million babies. God bless her, right? Over a million babies a queen ant can have. Um, I learned that there are over 12,000 species of ants, over 12,000 
10,000 species of ants. And if you were to take all of the ants in the world and, ta- and take their weight and take all of the humans in the world and their weight, it would equal about the same thing. Now, we're in this series. It's not a typical Father's Day sermon. We're in the middle of a summer series called The Money Challenge. And last time we were together two weeks ago, we looked at giving generously. We talked about that we should give generously because God gave us to us generously by sending his son. And we talked about leveraging everything we had for the gospel, winning people to Jesus Christ, passing our money forward to the next kingdom to come. Well, today we're going to talk about saving wisely. Dave Ramsey says this, We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. Let me say that again. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have so that we can impress people we don't like. Well, today we're going to learn some lessons from the ant. We're going to learn how to save wisely. And as we save wisely, it is going to set us up and put us in a position so that we can give generously. It is going to set us up in a position so that we can leverage everything we have for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's look at Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Go to the ant, you slacker. Observe its ways and become wise. Without leader, administrator, or ruler, it prepares its provisions in summer. It gathers its food during the harvest. Now here is Solomon. He is the wisest man to ever live. He, he wrote the book of Song of Solomon. We spent three months in. And he also wrote the book of Proverbs. If you're looking to start reading the Bible, the Proverbs is a great book to start reading your Bible. There's 31 Proverbs. You can read one uh, chapter each day and read through it in a month. So I would encourage you to do that. And so here in this, this book of wisdom that Solomon has written, the wisest man, he, he tells us to go to the ant and study it. He says, go to the ant, you slacker. Now, when we think of ant, we think of industrious. We think of diligent. We think of someone that works tirelessly. We think of someone that plans ahead. And here Solomon is instructing us to go to this person, this ant, excuse me, that is industrious, that is diligent, and study them. And here he's referring there is a certain type of person that is to go to the ant and study them. The slacker. Now, if you're reading out of the New King James or King James Version, it means sluggard. It may say that. Uh, What it really means is lazy. It means irresponsible. It means one that lacks self-control. Now, particularly here in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, Solomon is referring to this idea of a slacker or a sluggard or someone that is lazy in saving, someone that is lazy in preparing, someone that is lacks self-control in saving, someone that lacks self-control in and spending or preparing. It, it, basically, it would be what Dave Ramsey calls as the, the free person, the peace person, the, the, the person that's just uh, all the time out there shopping and spending. Now, the reason that we are to look at the ant, the reason the lazy person, the slack person is to look at the ant is because we are slack in, when we are slack in savings, it affects more than just our wallet. It affects and hurts our generosity. When you're not saving well, it will hurt you in giving generously. It, it will affect you leveraging more for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here are some lessons we can learn from an ant. The first thing we can learn from an ant is this. We are to save wisely. We are to save wisely, or saving is wise. We, we see this from the ant. Solomon here in this text is praising the ant's wisdom. The ant here, he is storing or she is storing food. They are working hard. They, are, they know its mission. They, they are focused in on the mission. Saving is wise. It's an aspect of wisdom. Now, I don't remember why I remembered this, but as a kid, I remember seeing the cartoon, and last night, honestly, I went to Google, and I put it in, and I found it, and I was going to play it today, but honestly, the video was even too cheesy for me. But maybe you remember this video growing up of the ant. He's working really hard in the summer, and there was the grasshopper. Y'all remember this? And the grasshopper's playing the fiddle all summer. He's playing in the pool. He's just kind of goofing off, and and there's the ants. They got laser-like focus on the mission. They're just continually in the summer. They're just continuing to save food. And then in this video, and I 
Go home, check it out. These things are cheesy, guys. You've got to check it out. Anyway, so there in the winter, it comes winter, there's a big snowfall, and the grasshopper is not saved all winter, and so he's shivering, and he's still got his fiddle, though, um, and so he had mortgaged it. And so there he's just, you know, he's shivering, he knocks on the door, he swallows his pride, and the ant invites the grasshopper in, he warms up, he plays the fiddle, and they live happily ever after. Well, I, I, listen, that's what we're talking about today. The ant is going to store up food. He's going to save food all summer. This is the primary focus and the mission for the summer with the ant, which side note, we declared our mission last week is to love God, love others, and serve both. I pray that we would have a laser-like focus on that mission that God has given us, that we wouldn't let side things distract us from the mission that God has called us to. It is wise for the ant to do this because the ant knows that winter is coming. Now, I grew up in southeastern North Carolina pretty much my whole entire life. Three years, Jenny and I went to the wilderness and moved to the Piedmont part of the state. But for the most part, we've been in God's country, southeastern North Carolina, all right? And there's one thing we know that takes place in southeastern North Carolina is this, is a hurricane is going to happen eventually. Uh, We know they're going to come. And now, that's one thing that shocked me about moving up here to you northern people, all right? Because y'all are northern for me, all right? And, and so it's one thing that just shocked me was when I grew and lived at the beach, we knew to prepare for a hurricane because we were going to feel things. We knew that the wind was going to blow. When we lived in Bladen County, we knew that we were close to the coast and the flood was coming. I, I remember when three years ago a hurricane came through and we had the church bus evacuating people on the other side of the river. I knew, but when I moved up here, I was not expecting any of that. So we've been here about a month, and a hurricane decided it was going to come through. And so you know what we did? I said, well, honey, I said, I don't think it's going to be that bad. I said, we're inland. I said, let's just go to, let's just go to Food Line, and let's get some water just in case. And you know what took place when I showed up at Food Line? <laughs> Y'all were there too, weren't you? There was no water to be found. So I went to Wilson thinking, oh, hey, you know what? That's further north. They ain't going to think anything about it. Guess what? In Wilson, there was no water to be found. I said, well, let's go south. I said, certainly down south, they'll have some water. Let's go to Smithfield. Nope, no water to be found. I started checking in every other hour at Food Line to make sure I could get some water for my family. I bought in. And then I have a generator. So, you know, I said I needed some non-ethanol gas. And so I called Pit Stop, and guess what? They didn't have any. I called the big boys down there. Guess what? They didn't have any. They even put me on a waiting list. I, so I sat by the phone waiting just in case I could get this gas to power my house. I mean, people were going crazy over a hurricane off the shore. Why were they preparing? Because a storm they knew could be on the horizon. See, the reason I say that is we are to save month to month to month to month. Why? Because there are going to be storms that come in each and every one of our lives. You're going to go to the doctor for a routine checkup. And the doctor's going to say, we need to run some tests because we see something. Or, or in my case, you have a cold and you go in because, let's just be honest, we need a Z-pack because we got to keep going. And, and the doctor finds your heart beat at 150 beats per minute and can't figure out why. And all of a sudden, a storm hits you you weren't expecting. You go home and from, let's pray this doesn't happen, but you go home after church and Some crazy person that doesn't know how to build a house decides the best place for your hot water heater is in the attic. And so all of a sudden, all of a sudden between your floors or maybe the ceiling, all of a sudden it's raining down in your house because the hot water heater is not underneath the house where it could run off and not do a lot of damage or in the garage, it's in the attic. I don't know why anybody would think that would be a smart place to put a hot water heater, but they do. And so you go home and you find it there and your water is leaking. You go out to crank the car one day morning you're going to go to work and it won't crank and you look underneath the car and there's oil running down your driveway you go in on friday you collect your paycheck you show up on monday and the boss says well i need to see you he brings you in the office and he has to let you go storms happen they come this past week i read something and it shocked me The average American in the United States cannot afford a $400 emergency. The average American in the United States cannot afford a $400 emergency. Now, let's just be real this morning. When you go into the doctor and they say they need to run some tests, like a CT scan, it's more than $400. 
you, you go to get your car fixed because there's oil running underneath it. I don't care if you can fix it yourself or not. It, it's more than $400. You have hot water coming from your ceiling. If you buy a new hot water heater and you buy it yourself and you patch the ceiling with your own sheetrock, it's going to cost you more than $400. But yet, the average American is not set up to handle a $400 emergency. Do you know how we handle the emergencies, most of us? We get those unexpected storms. And then all of a sudden, we pull out Mr. Visa, Mr. MasterCard, Mr. Discover, or Mrs. American Express. And we say, we're going to charge this. We're going to fix it. We're going to pay for this. And you know what takes place is, all of a sudden, we're in a crisis. Why we're in a crisis? Because what was a $400 to $1,000 fix turns into a $1,500, $2,000 fix depending on how much you're paying in interest and how long it takes you to pay off that credit card. We need to save wisely. Saving wise because it sets us up to handle the emergencies of life that all of us know that are coming. Second, we learn from the ants' abundance and scarcity We learn from the ant's abundance and scarcity. The ant prepares in the summer and gathers the harvest, times of abundance to prepare for the times of scarcity and the winter. The ant doesn't have to worry. Why? Because they have prepared all summer. They are ready for the storm they know that is coming. They have a peace of mind. They have a peace of mind in the winter time. When we go through these storms, don't we struggle sometimes having peace? Like, how am I going to pay for this? What am I going to do? Where is the peace of mind when we go through the storms of life? Well, we find peace from abiding in God and taking advantage of the summer months he has given us. So many times I hear people say, I don't know how I'm going to pay for this. It just kind of hit me out of the blue. I don't know how I'm going to fix the car. And a lot of times I don't. I just kind of hold it within. And I just want to say, where have you been preparing the past 15 years? God gave you the time to save. He gave you 15 summers. And all of a sudden he sent the storm. But because you had to have that new car, because you had to have that new iPhone, because you had to have that new technology, because you had to have that new house that you can't afford, you can't afford the the wintertime that have come God's like I've given you plenty of time to save you just didn't take advantage of it you decided you were going to be the grasshopper and just play the fiddle we all want a peace of mind I've been to the emergency room quite a few times with my children or one child in particular he hasn't learned how to fall yet. He takes after his mama. And I said it in first service, so I'll just say it here. I can get in trouble. It's my birthday, by the way, honey. Show grace. All right. And so, um, and Father's Day, double whammy, all right? But he takes after his mama. He hasn't learned how to fall. He's missing a tooth. And the reason he's missing a tooth is because he hasn't learned to put his hands out. So when he falls, he just hits head first. And so I, I'm not making it up. It's just the truth. And so um, he's, got a, he's got a scar back here. He's got a scar up here. Because, man, we've been to the emergency room. And I know what they do for a kid. It's not pleasant. As a parent there, you struggle, right? Because, I mean, your kid, he's bleeding from the head. I mean, I'm thinking he's got my brains. He ain't got many to begin with. Let's not rattle these things much more. I mean, I mean, you got all these thoughts kind of running through your mind when you're sitting there with your child. And then it comes to the point where they have to put in stitches. And when it comes to a child and putting in stitches, what they do is they put him in a, uh, they take a, a sheet and they wrap him up in a cocoon. And then you have to help hold down that child while he's screaming. I mean, it is a traumatic experience in itself. But could you imagine while you're sitting there facing all of that in the back of your mind thinking, how in the world am I going to pay for this? I didn't see this coming. I thought surely my son would know that when he falls, he should put his hands out. We've all been there. How are we going to pay for this? Hear me. Bad financial decisions cost us. We must save in the summer months of life that God has given us. I want you to learn from my mistakes. See, if I'm honest with you this morning, Jenny and I should have been debt-free about five years ago. It broke my heart this past Wednesday night when we took financial peace. And, and, and Joey said, write down what you owe. And I, I felt good because I owed less this time than I did last time. Then I calculated the number of years that it had been. And I'm like, what have I been doing? We all make bad mistakes, right? Like the time 
I mean, we all make bad mistakes. We all don't take advantage of the summer months that God has given us. Like Dave Ramsey said, we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. We all want to keep up with the Joneses. Like, like the time that I thought I needed a brand new Mustang, even though I had a car paid off. Or the time that Jenny and I went from a one-bedroom apartment and what we decided we wanted was a 2,400-square-foot house with four bedrooms and a studio on the side. That was a stupid decision. Or, or the time that, you know, me and Jenny decided we were going to go on vacation. And I, the beach wasn't enough, so I, I, bought, I rented a house for the week that had a pool. My kids didn't even use the pool that much. Or the time that we had another paid-off car, and I just needed a jacked-up pickup truck that drove 14 miles per gallon, because that was a really smart move, that only lasted me about two years before the transmission went out. We've all been there, right? We've all made bad decisions financially. There's a lot we can learn from the ant. Sitting here today, I just think if I'd only taken that extra money and applied it to my debt. I'd be standing before you this morning a free man. Having no master but Jesus Christ. Third, the ant sets a saving goal. The ant knows what it needs to save. It knows what it needs to gather. Sammy J yesterday went to a birthday party. And so I told my baby girl, we'll do whatever you want to do. So you know what my baby girl says? She said, I want to watch a movie. I said, great. What movie? Over the Hedge. So we watched Over the Hedge, and in Over the Hedge, it's a great movie. Jenny's the squirrel in that movie by far, all right? If you know Jenny, you will know that. She is it, all right? And it's not pick on Jenny, damn I mean, it's just what I think of when I think of squirrel. I love you, dear. And so um, we're watching this movie, and, and the turtle comes out, and the turtle says, we only had these five berries left, and if had we ate these five berries, we would have died in the winter. And then at the end of the movie... The squirrel says, I have found my nuts. <laughs> and he brings it and he fills the log up to the top of the thing of the log. They had to fill the log up. So he fills the log up with all of his nuts he had been storing all summer. He's like, we're ready for winter. We need to be storing and saving because winter is coming. They knew the goal. They knew what they had to put in the log because they knew what they had to have to get through the winter. Many of us here, we don't even know what we need to make it. So I'm going to lay it out very clearly for you this morning because I've been doing a lot of reading. I'm going to lay out practical principles for you. Here you go. What you need if you read the money challenge, which I encourage you, which is tied to your Sunday school lesson, or if you take financial peace, is somewhere you need a partial emergency fund of 1000 to $1,500. Keep in mind that is a partial emergency fund. You don't need this in a Roth IRA. You don't need this in a CD. You don't need this in your retirement. You need 1000 to $1,500 sitting there that is quick access for you so when your kid doesn't know how to fall and you end up at the emergency room, you got some money to pay for it. You need 1000 to $1,500 there. And once you save up that 1000 to $1,500, what you need to do is what Joey told me this past Thursday when I was crying over how much I'd really been paying off my debt is you need to go after your debt with gazelle intensity, meaning that there is a cheetah chasing the gazelle and you're running with your life. And so you need to throw everything you've got, including the kitchen sink at your debt. Starting with the smallest debt, no matter what the interest rate is, pay that thing off and then you take everything you were paying on that and you apply it to the next debt. You pay that off and then you apply it to the next debt and then you apply it to the next debt. But we're not done there because when you get done paying the debt, it's a partial emergency fund. The last time I checked, $1,500 in this economy ain't going to get us a lot. So what you need to do then is you need to have a fully emergency fund. And so you start saving three to six months worth of savings. You put it in your checking account that you do not touch or you put it in a separate savings account. Now, I know what some of you are asking. You're, some of you are not even asking. You're saying, oh, he said three to six months. I'm handing on the three-month part. I'm good. Three months is if you're single, you're not married, you can handle three months. Why? Because in three months, if you get fired from your job, you can at least end up working at Wendy's or McDonald's or the true food store, and you can supply yourself. But many of us here, we're, we're not single. We have a spouse. We have kids. And so you need to err on the six months' worth of savings. 
You need six months of whatever your living cost is in a savings account. Why? So that you can handle the emergencies to come. Now, we're doing this series this morning, and we're doing it, and we're talking about saving wisely, and last week we talked about giving generously, but I I need to clear something up. Our security is not found in what we have in our Roth IRA. And by the way, you want a Roth IRA because you pay taxes on that up front and not the end. Some of you just put in an IRA, you're going to have a big surprise when you get older. You're going to pay taxes on it then. And so I'm just laying that out for you, all right? Your security is not found in your Roth IRA. It's not found in your 401k that the company matches. It is not found in how much you have in your savings account. It's not even found that, that you have a fully stocked emergency fund or that you're debt free. Our security is not found in any of that. Our security this morning is found in none other than Jesus Christ. That is the only place you're going to find true security. Might I just remind you of Job? Job was probably more wealthy than any of us put together. And yet Job, in an instant, a storm hit his life and he lost his children. He lost everything he had. But yet in the middle of that, where did he find his security? It was in God. See, our security comes in having a relationship with Jesus Christ. My security is not as what is in my checking account or what is in my retirement. My security comes 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ died upon the cross because I know that when I take my last breath here, I'm stepping in and I'm taking my next breath in the presence of Jesus Christ. That is where my security comes from. It is not in secure, it's not in checking accounts, or it's not in 401ks. It is in Jesus Christ. And so we cannot confuse that in the middle of this series as we're talking about saving wisely. I love what Dave Ramsey says. He says, pray like it depends on God, but work like it depends on you. Pray like it depends on God, but work like it depends on you. I noticed when I read this text that it said that they did not, that the ants in verse number seven do not have anybody over them, leaders or anybody telling them something. Now, I'm just going to go here and I need to go here. Listen, if you're here this morning and you collect the check from the government because you cannot work, listen, that is okay. We're a church and we want to help you as well. But part of Genesis chapter one, two, and three is this. That part of the problem, part of the, the, the result of sin entering the world is that we as men would have to go to work and not depend on the government and not depend on the church. If you're a man and you're able, you should be working, not sitting at home collecting a check and going to Walmart where everybody hates going that one time a month because there's a line 15 people deep buying some cigarettes and beer. You're to work. That is part of the fall. Ladies, I hate to break it to you. Part of the fall and the punishment for you was pain during labor. You can thank Eve all for that. But notice, the ants doesn't have to have somebody telling them they have to go to work. They're smart enough to understand that winter is coming, and because winter is coming, I need to work and store up. It's basic logic, right? We know storms are coming, and how do we prepare for storms? we got to have money, and how do we get money? We go to work. So some of you this morning, what God may be saying to you and the Holy Spirit saying to you this morning is get off your rear end and go to work and find a job. Fourth, the ant knows persistence. Saving requires time and hard work. Saving requires hard work and it requires time. Day in, day after day after day after day, the ant gets up and the ant has one objective in the summer. What is that? I've got to store food. I've got to store food. Winter is coming. Winter is coming. I've got to store food. That is their objective. Yesterday, or Saturday, my son had another run-in with ants. And and so we're out there, and I'm trying to kill these ants. I've got spray. I've bought some poison. I'm spraying the ants. I'm doing everything I can. And you know what those ants keep on doing as I'm spraying? They keep on working. Nothing is going to stop them from collecting. I mean, I'm telling you, I'm trying to kill them. They're still trying to climb the tree and get some food and bring it back to the nest. They are determined. Man, can I just say this? What if the church was that determined for the mission that God has given us, that no matter what comes our way no matter what Satan brings we're going to keep our eyes focused on the cross we're going to still keep on going to the community and telling them about Jesus Christ you think Kinley would be a different community today oh we can learn a lot from the end because what takes place for a lot of us is something over here hits us and all of a sudden we avert all of our attention here and we forget that we need to collect food winter is coming we see here 
They keep on going. They know winter is coming. They work hard. It's hard work. I told you, they lift 10 to 50 times their body weight. As these ants are carrying 10 times to 50 times their body weight. Do you think they enjoy that? Do you think it's easy? Do you think, oh, this is a piece of cake? No, they're struggling. They're just like, I've got to get this back. Why? Because winter is coming. There is a storm coming. I've got to get food to the mound. I've got to store it for the winter. They're carrying these heavy things. It's hard work. It's heavy on them. It's not easy. It requires time and it requires effort. I have a saying around my house. You didn't get here overnight and it's probably not going to be fixed overnight. And many of us live in an instant gratification world where we want to go through the line at McDonald's and have it our way. Or Burger King, excuse me, and have it our way. You didn't get here overnight and it's probably not going to be fixed overnight. It is going to require time. It is going to require you saving. It is going to require hard work. It is going to require sacrifice. For some this morning, it's going to take a lot of sacrifice. It's going to take a lot of hard work. It's going to take you saying no to a lot of good things. Let me give you a couple I'm saying no to. Jenny has a dream. We're going to go to Disney World. We ain't going anytime soon. We may swing by next year at the Southern Baptist Convention because they very conveniently put it in Orlando. I'm going to give my kids six hours in the Magic Kingdom, and that's it. Why? Because we're saying no, because we've got to get out of debt. I've got to chase it with gazelle intensity. You can thank Joey for that one, all right? And so gazelle intensity, we've got to go after this. My kids, they want a tree house. They want a trampoline, and they want a dog. Do not give me a dog. It will go to the pound. I'm just saying up front, don't put it at my doorstep this afternoon. Think it's cute. I will send it to the pound. All right? Don't do it. But they want a trampoline, and they want a, they want, they want, they want a tree house. And I, and I say, son, I love you, but no. I'd love to give them a... I, listen, I don't want to be a main parent. I'd love to give them a place to get out of the house so I can have the house to myself for a couple hours. Y'all with me? Amen if you're a parent. Like, let's get them outside. However, it's better for me to tell them no up front. Jenny and I dream of having a back lot that has grass and maybe a pool. I mean, I, I, I can justify the pool. It could be ministry. Children's ministry could come over and use the pool. Oh, man, I could have church people over. And then I look at the 20 to 30 grand it's going to cost me to have that pool, and I'm thinking I could almost be out of debt. Some of us just need to learn the word No. It is an acceptable answer sometimes. Telling our kids, no. Telling our wife or our husband, if they are the ones that are spenders, no, it's not in the budget. One thing I, I do want is this, or I don't want today is this. There are some of you, and honestly, I can relate, you're struggling. You're struggling financially, and you're like, I'm in debt up to here. The average American has $15,000 of credit card debt, and I learned this past week from J.D. Greer that the average person in the Raleigh-Durham area, which we're almost there, has $14,000 of credit card debt. So I'm assuming I'm speaking to some people here that are just deep in debt. Even though you may be driving the new vehicle, you may look everything good on the flesh. When you pull back the layers, you're deep in debt, and some of you are discouraged and you feel defeated. But I want to say this, no matter how hard it may be, no matter the sacrifice you may have to make, don't give up don't give up don't give up it's worth the hard work it's worth the time it's worth the sacrifice your family will benefit down the road for you saying no today as much as I want to take my kids to Disney World, me telling them no now so I can get out of debt, so I can afford, afford me and Jenny a retirement home one day, is a lot better for them. I've been talking to Pastor Dario. I, I really believe one of the things we need to do in the senior adults here is offer a legacy class. Do you know how many times I've sat down with senior adults and watched kids fight after the senior adult passes away? Can I just testify for a minute? When you die, it costs your children something. The average funeral is somewhere between six and $8,000. That's the reason a lot of people get cremated. Now, if you're really cheap, I'm not telling you should do this, but you can buy caskets from Costco and Walmart. Go online and Google it, I promise you. That'll do your heart good. What I've told Jenny to give me, just give me a box or give me a Walmart casket. That's I, I, I all I want. Take that money and use it for something else. 
But in this legacy class, it's going to teach you how to deal with wills. It's going to show you how in the end days to set up your funeral so kids aren't fighting over who is doing what and who is singing what and who is preaching what. It's going to talk about how you should save and set yourself up for retirement. And if you're in retirement, how you can set yourself up. There's many of us who need this. We need to know how to handle money in our last days. As I've looked at school systems, as I've looked at programs online, there aren't many people teaching about dealing with God's money, but yet I find that God spends more time, Jesus spent more time talking about generosity than he did heaven and hell combined. It is time that we in the church step up and give this community something they need practically, how they can handle their finances. We need to show people how to handle finances, how they can save how they can help their family down the road. Think about it. As you get older, you've got children. Don't you want to have enough in your checking account and savings account and your Roth IRA where you can afford the house so kids aren't having to worry about where you're going to spend your last days and what they're going to have to sell and how they're going to have to pawn this to keep your medical bill. Let's just be honest. Because as you get older, I've learned, you have to take more medicine. And it's not just a house. The medicine you get. I've heard of some of our senior adults, one prescription costs them over $1,000 a month. Think about your children. You can play the fiddle now like the grasshopper, but somebody is going to pay down the road for it. Don't let it be your kids. Love your family enough to prepare and save wisely. Now, some of you this morning, you, you may have some objections. One could be is, I don't have enough to live on now, let alone how am I going to save? That could be some of you here, you're like, it sounds great. I, I want to save, Pastor, but I don't even have enough to meet my monthly bills. Here's the words of wisdom I would give you. This is going to sound crazy. The first thing you should do is start giving. Why? Because if you don't give when you're dirt poor, you're certainly not going to give when you're rich. And all you're going to become is a Scrooge off the Christmas carol. Start giving. The second thing I'm going to encourage you to do is this. Start saving for an emergency, a partial emergency fund. $1,000, $1,500. Put it in a savings account. Put it in a checking account that is not your regular checking account or your regular savings account. Something you're not going to touch. Then throw everything you've got, including the kitchen sink, at your debt. Get that debt paid off and then fully fund your emergency account. Then start putting everything you can in retirement. Looking forward to the last years you're going to be on this earth. As you're putting in retirement, also start paying off your house. Get it paid off early and start giving like there is no tomorrow. You know... I want to be that person. And God's just through the series, God has been convicting me. Man, what I really could, he's just been showing me like, here's what you could do if you hadn't made these stupid decisions in the past. Like for instance, this past week, Kevin, he's doing something really cool. He's a worship leader in our first, in our first service. He is starting a band for fifth graders in micro. Man, that's incredible because listen, I, I don't care whether you like music or not, but it is a proven fact that if your kids are in music and they're taking music, they're smarter. That should lead all of us to go get our kids in some music classes, right? He's starting a band. And I saw where he wanted a donation of $241 to furnish the books for Micro. And I said, man, God, if I hadn't made some of these idiot decisions in the past, how cool would it be for me just to sit back and write a check for $241 and fund every band student that is going to come through their, their book where they don't have to worry about it? See, when I set myself up and we set ourselves up with savings, then we can do cool things like that. But you've got to be able to sacrifice up front. So I encourage you. You say, I can't do it. I would say, how can you not afford to do it? Second, you may say, well, I just don't know where to begin. I don't know where to begin on this process. Now, this is a true story. And sometimes as a pastor, I've never let the truth keep me from telling a good story. I'm just honest about it. I've never let the truth keep me from telling a good story. But this one here is the truth. There is, I'm not exaggerating. I haven't got to make anything else up on this one. This is just a good story. So, and Jenny will vouch for me on this. And if not, I'll give you the person you can call him, all right? I was ordained. And one thing they didn't tell me up front when I became ordained was this. 
is that I was going to be considered self-employed. And one thing you may not know is, is when you become self-employed, there's this thing out there the government likes to do. is called self-employment tax. Some of y'all feel the pain, right? I'll be honest. I felt the pain last year. I had to write a check to the IRS for sixteen to $18,000. I mean, self-employment tax. It costs you. And I love the government. I love they're trying to help us. But let's just be honest. They're doing away with individual itemizations. Now you've got the standard deductions unless you have given like $21,000 away. And so I wasn't aware of any of this when I was ordained. I'd have probably told them no because I'm just cheap. <laughs> and so I went in to my accountant. and She's been my accountant for many, many years. And she's a godly lady. Her husband's a pastor in the Pentecostal church. It's who the IRS actually recommended I go to. And I am not lying. She told me, she says, you may be in trouble. So here's what you need to do. So I went to my floorboard of my truck, my car, whatever I had at the time. Went digging through every pocket I had trying to find any receipt I possibly could find. I put it in a shoebox. And I carried it to her office. And she says, what is this? I said, My receipts, here you go. We sat there for three hours going through every receipt I had, trying to figure out what was deductible and what was not deductible. I had no idea where to begin. Maybe that's you here this morning. You're deep in debt, and you have no idea where to begin. Well, see, our vision here at Kinley Missionary Baptist Church is love God, love others, and serve both. And maybe you're here today and you just don't know where to begin. Well, before we began this series, I went to four or five individuals who are debt-free and really know how to handle finances, and I said this. Would you be willing to sit down with people who do not understand and work with them on where to begin? And I've got four or five people lined up that are willing just to sit down. They're good at handling money. Sit down with you one-on-one. You bring your shoe boxes of receipts or your budget or whatever else you got, your bills, and they're willing to sit down with you and help you through the process. Now, listen, here's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying when you sit down with them, they're going to give you a dime of money. All right? I believe we should help you if you're in trouble, but you worked yourself in this mess, and I believe part of this, you should work yourself out of it. And so we're willing to help, but the help we're going to give you is to help you long term. We're not going to give free handouts. That's not what this is. You sit down with a person, you say, here are my bills, and they write you a check for $20,000. That's not what this is. This is somebody sitting down with you and saying, here's the steps you need to go. Now, you need to be ready because some of you, let's just be honest, you're deep in debt, and what you've got is a $160 a month satellite bill so you can watch all the prime sports. And probably what they're going to tell you, the first thing you need to do is cut the cord. There's others of you, you're going to walk in, you've got a nice X or iPhone 10 and your bill for Verizon or whoever AT&T you've got is $168 and it's cheaper to get out of the contract and they're going to tell you, you don't need that phone. You need to be ready before you walk in this room because that's the type of wisdom they're going to give you to get out of this. Some of you, you got the fastest type of internet that you could have and you're like, I got to have internet. No, you don't. I don't have internet. It's been great. We cut the cord three months ago. I don't know if we'll ever get internet back, even if they bring it to my community. Hotspot it. It works just as good. But we want to offer help to you. So how do you get that help? In a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to bow your head, and there's a yellow card in the pew. It's called a decision card. People did it in the first service. I'm going to encourage you to do it. When we say, bow your head, I'm going to tell you, take that card out. There isn't a place for this. At the end, just say, I don't know where to begin. Write it at the bottom. Put your name and information. And then one of these individuals will be in contact with you this week to figure out a time that you can sit down. And by the way, when you sit down with them, it's confidential. I'm not even going to know what is said in those meetings. I don't want to know. This is between you and them. We just want to help you get out of debt. We want to help you set up. If you're sitting here and say, my objection today is I don't know where to begin, here's where you begin. Fill the yellow card out. As I finish today, I want to introduce you to the average millionaire in America. It's a guy named Don, and he is a real person. He's in his 60s, and he is retired. 
See, we, I, I read this book called The Millionaire Next Door this past month, and, and we have a lot of misconceptions when it comes to millionaires. We think a millionaire in America is a lawyer, a doctor, a neurosurgeon, somebody that mama and daddy was really wealthy and they handed down, but that is not the average of millionaire in America. See, the average millionaire in America is probably sitting right next to you and you have no idea. Did you know that the average millionaire in America buys an American-made product when it comes to a vehicle? Most of them are Fords. That the average American millionaire doesn't own a five, uh, doesn't own an Armani suit. They, if they own a suit, most likely they don't own a suit. But if they own a suit, they bought it from Belts or J.C. Penney's. The watch of choice for the average American millionaire is not Rolex. It is not an eye watch. It is a Timex. The average American woman pays only $18 a month for a haircut. So let me introduce you to Don, who is a real-life person. Don is in his 60s, and he is retired. And, and let me clarify, a millionaire isn't somebody, because you're like, we got all these athletes, yes, but a millionaire is not somebody who makes a million dollars. It's somebody that has a million dollars sitting in a checking account that isn't going to anything. Many people make lots of money, but they're throwing it out the back window as much as it's coming in the front window. Don, the average, let me give you this, the average American millionaire has lived in their house more than 20 years in your neighborhoods. The average, million, um, the average American millionaire isn't a doctor. Don's not a doctor. He's not a lawyer. He didn't work in Silicon Valley. You know where he worked? He was an electrician. The average American millionaire only makes about $131,000 per family. And by they retire, they have $3.7 million sitting in their checking account. This is Don. He's, a, he's an electrician. You know what he does in his free time now in his 60s? Because he could retire and not have to worry about anything? He works at the church helping them when something breaks. He helps the church help their facilities. By the way, if you're Don here, we'd love to have you help Mr. Doug and others out with our facilities. That's what Don does. He volunteers his time at the church, volunteering to be generous in the community. Some of you are like, how in the world did an electrician become a millionaire? I'm going to give you the ingredients right here. They saved wisely. They lived frugally, which we'll talk about next week. And they limited their debt and put everything they had into retirement. It really is just that simple. So as I conclude today, here's my challenge for you. Will you commit to be a saver? Will you commit to save? Not so that you can be rich, because that's not why Solomon wrote this. Will you commit to save so that you can give more generously? Will you commit to save so that you can leverage more of your time, your assets, your money for the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's why we save. So that we, when I retire, and I look forward to that day when I can retire, I can stand in a pulpit one day for a congregation that is hurting when I retire, hopefully from this church, and say, you don't have to pay me a dime. I know you're in financial strengths. I'm going to give you my services. Because I want to give generously back to God because he has blessed me so. Will you commit to be a saver so that you can take the gifts that God has given you and you can give them back for the kingdom of God? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Praise team is going to make their way up. As they make their way up, nobody is looking around. I'm going to ask that nobody look around. Maybe today you heard about the gospel, how Jesus Christ came and saved, and that's where we find our security. And God this morning is calling you. Call on the name of the Lord and be saved. So right there where you're sitting, all you have to do is call out to God quietly and say, God, I admit I'm a sinner, that I have thought things, said things, and done things that you hate. God, I admit I'm a sinner. God, I, I need you to come in and be the boss of my life. God, I'm giving up my life to follow you. In Jesus' name. You can pray something like that. If you do pray something like that, I'm going to encourage you to take one of those yellow cards, those decision cards, fill it out. At the end of service, I'll be standing in the back. You can just bring it to me, and I'll be glad to take it. Maybe you're here today, and, man, we've got a bad, big baptism coming up July 14th, and we've got six or seven other people lined up for baptism. Maybe God's just calling you to be the next one. Would you take that decision card out like some others have and fill it out and just hand it to me at the end of service and we'll sit down and talk to you about baptism. Maybe God's calling you to join his team here at Kinley Missionary Baptist Church and be on mission for him with loving God, loving others, and serving both. And you want to be part of that. I'm going to encourage you to take 
that you'll look hard out, fill it out, and we'll be getting up with you about our new members class. Maybe you just don't know where to begin today, and God's just saying, take the yellow card out right at the bottom of it. I don't know where to begin. Put your name and hand it to me at the end of service, and we will line you up with somebody to sit down and talk with. Maybe you're like me this past week as I was studying this text. God has given you summer months. He's given you summer years to store and save wisely, and honestly, you just didn't. You've been the grasshopper with the fiddle. And this morning, you just need to repent. God, I haven't used your money the way you would have me to use it. Maybe you're here and we're just honest with each other. You ain't even got to be honest with me, but you just want to be honest with God because he knows you're lazy. You're a slacker. God's called you to work and you've just been sitting down, taking free handouts wherever you can take free handouts. And God this morning is convicting of you of that. Would you repent of that this morning and say, God, I'm sorry. You created me to work. You created me to toil because of the sin. And God, I have been taking free handouts. Maybe God's calling you to come up during this time of invitation and sign this board over here to the mission. Last week we, we gave it and we said, go home and pray about it. And if God's calling you to the mission, we got Sharpies up here. During the time of invitation, you just come sign your name to it, that you're going to commit to loving God, loving others, and serving both. Maybe that's what God's calling you to do. Let us pray, and then you can respond. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray you would just move during this time of invitation. God, that if people need help, God, they would truly reach out for help today. God, they would sign, I don't know where to begin, and God, we would get them the help they need by lining them up somebody. God, if somebody has a true need, God, may they just let us know about it. We can help them there. God, I pray, God, that you would just move here, God, that we would all be savers so that later on in our life we can help our family, but, God, that we can live generously on mission for you. God, serving you, giving of our time and of our talents because you've blessed us so. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you go ahead and stand? You're either going to be singing, filling out a card, coming to the altar. If you need to come talk to me, I'll be down front, or filling out a bulletin board over there.
today. If you're a first-time guest or a guest here today, we are so glad to have you. If you do not have a church home, we would love to see you back next week as we talk about living frugally and um, living within our means. We'd love to have you join us on this money challenge. Also, if you're here today and you really do need help, please let us know. We want to love our community and love others. We're about to head into a business meeting because we've got to vote on a a committee to hire a part-time children's director here. So if you're a guest, we're just going to ask if you would to meet me and my wife at the back door after I get done praying, and Pastor Bob will come up and lead that business meeting. Let us pray, and then if you're a guest, we'll ask you to be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray, God, that um, God, we would just save wisely. God, so that we could be on mission for you and give of our time, our talents, our efforts, God, without having to worry about the struggles. God, that we would save wisely, God, for our children and those that have come after us. So, God, they don't have to make hard decisions, God, when it comes to us and us getting older. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.